So, hello, welcome, and good evening to another soldering video, or soldering video, with um, some new toys. Matthias, or Matze 79 of the Tendi Sound Cut fame, donated these two things to me. And what could it be but another sound card, or rather two? And something very special indeed. So one of these things is his very own design. Um, we'll have a look at his website in a second. This is the simple LPT sound, which is sort of um, a digital to analog converter for the parallel port. This is a parallel port connector and it's more or less only uh, just simply a resistor ladder with a audio jack attached to it. And it's a very simple deck that can be used by quite a few games. And yeah, it's nice. I have never built such a thing. And I have a couple of games or tools that can use it. And we will do that and see how it works. This should be pretty fast. I guess we need something like 10 minutes, 15 minutes to solder that maximum. The second one is also interesting because this is actually by Serako who sells a lot of retro sound card and sound devices. And uh, he has a lot of the different um, Adlib clones with LPT port, OPL3, OPL2. And this is actually the Tandy sound card with LPT port. And yeah, uh, it's available now from seradashop.com. We'll also have a look at that. And we will also try to assemble this. It's obviously much more components. It's uh, roughly the same components as we have on the Tandy sound card, so it will take a little bit longer. And it also attaches to the um, parallel port. And you need a TSR to actually remap the I.O. address from the original Tandy to the LPD port, but there's a driver available. Or you use a special program like VGM Play, which can perhaps access this thing directly. So this one here gives you um, digitized voice or music, like mod players and stuff like that. While this one gives you Tandy Sound, the three voice square wave. Pretty neat. And yeah, this one is actually a very simple thing, consisting mostly of resistors and a few capacitors. And this one has all the magic that you need, um, the SN76489 chip and stuff like that. So let's take a look at the website. So this is the uh, shop from Serdaco, Serda shop. There's a lot of stuff here, retro sound cards, um, like yeah, the Covox modules, uh, which are a bit more fancy than the one that I got from Matthias, but also more expensive, I guess. Then he has the Dream Blaster wave modules, wave synthesis modules, um, which attach to standard sound blaster cards with wave blaster header. Then of course the OPLT, uh, OPL2 LPT, which is basically an adlib card for the parallel port. And the same thing with the OPL3 as well. So pretty nice stuff here. And um, yeah, really fresh now is the TND LPT and the whole thing here, the solder kit PCP plus components is 37 euros. Not really cheap but um, it's a ton of stuff that you're getting and uh, yeah I think it's it might be very nice let's see if we can make it work um, it takes less than one hour to solve the kit okay <laughs> that's that's something that we can uh, test I guess there's also a nice building guide but it should be pretty simple I probably keep this as a reference while assembling um, so there is an AT Tiny, it seems, probably for turning it on and off, just like with the uh, with Matz's Tenny card. And um, yeah, a lot of small stuff, the connector and everything, the amplifier, the sound chip, and a 7404. I'm not sure what that does. It's probably for buffering. I don't know. Let's look it up. 
744 datasheet. That's a hex inverter. Okay. Um, okay, six inverters. That's fine. Not sure why we need that, but yeah, I have no clue about the electronics aspect. But that's it. And um, then there is Matze's website, ritoyana.de, and you will find his projects here as well, like the LPT Sound R2, which is what we have here. Um, this is a digital analog converter with a resistor network and two capacitors, basically. So very, very simple. But it should work. We will test it out once we assemble it. A lot of mod players which will support this. We will test it with Modmaster XT. And um, yeah, we can test it with Scream Tracker. I do have that. And we can test it with uh, Pinball Fantasies or Pinball Dreams. I also have that. Should be quite nice. Um, all right. I would say we'll get started right away. Heating up the iron now and we're gonna assemble all the stuff. And here we are. It is finished. And uh, yeah, it looks very nice. The Most of the resistors are, I think, quarter watt resistors or something like that. But this big fat 330 ohms one is at least a half watt or something like that. And yeah, I need needed to push it a bit to the side and the spacing on the... Um, 0.47 nanofarads capacitor was also not optimal so it's a bit cranky in there um, but other than that I think uh, this should hopefully work fine we can just plug it onto the parallel port of the 386 and fire up some software and games to test it with so the principle here is actually that the eight data bits that come here go into the resistor ladder which um, then contribute to different amounts of amplitude which come out at the other end, basically. And there's a little bit of filtering due to the capacitors to make it sound more nice. And there's nothing else. You can't control the volume. It's not um, amplified or anything. It's totally passive. And that's pretty neat. Um, let's give it a spin. So the first game that we're going to try is Pinball Fantasies and it has a very wide variety of supported sound cards. It can even play the digitized music on the PC speaker. But here we switch from the Sound Blaster 2 that I was using before to the DA converter, which is basically a generic DAC attached to the LPT port, which is what we just built. Let's go for the medium sound quality. Maybe our 386 can manage to do that. And then let us fire up the game and have a listen. So that didn't sound half as bad. And the in-game music also sounds pretty reasonably. And this is definitely a device that you can use with um, Pinball Fantasies, for example. There are a bunch of other games that support this device, but they are of course not as widespread as, for example, games that support the Sound Blaster card. For the simple fact that the Sound Blaster offers much better quality and also lower CPU usage, because Every bit that is being played here has to be shifted manually over to the device. And this, of course, um, can't be done with more complex 3D games or stuff like that. Many of the DOS-based mod players that play digitized music actually support the LPT DAC variants. 
and Podmaster XT is one of those examples. It has a varied variety of support for different digital to analog converters. And let's have a listen how it sounds here. Okay, that definitely was wrong, but I chose 44 kilohertz, which I used with the Sound Blaster card. And yeah, let's reduce this to 22 kilohertz. Maybe this works. Okay, this didn't work out either, so let's decrease the sampling rate to 11 kilohertz. Definitely, the limitation here is how fast the CPU can push bits over the LPT port, and frankly enough, the 386 is not up to the task of more than 11 kilohertz. One further aspect where the LPT DAC shines is the demo scene. There are quite a bunch of old DOS demos that support the LPT DAC and similar devices, and Crystal Dream by Triton is one such example, and it actually does quite well. Have a listen here. Next up is the Tendi LPT sound card, which gives us 3 voice Tendi synthesized sound. It took me a bit longer than the deck, of course, because it has much more components. So here you go, here's the montage. The deed is done after a bit more than an hour and a few spare components that are left. This is the end result. It was pretty straightforward. The only thing that is different from a lot of the soldering jobs I did before is that all the resistors are mounted vertically, as you can see. And yeah, that was the main part and it's really densely packed in here. Uh, SMD components probably would have made sense here as well, but I like that all these kits are through hole only, which is easier, I think, for beginners. And yeah, the transistor is a bit stuffed in there with the uh, volume wheel, but I think that should work. Also, make sure that you place all the components in the right directions. The resistors don't matter, but the electrolytic capacitors are important. Line up the notches of the chips with the outlines on the board. Make sure to do that, otherwise they will go bang or simply overheat because they're shorted. Then the resistor packs have pin one over here. They are marked with a dot on the left side. So those have to be aligned as well. But other than that, the USB socket, I'm not sure if this is for powering the thing or if it powers itself. Probably not enough current over the parallel port, so it might be for power. I need to see if I have a cable ready. Um, and I think I do, yes. I think I do, yeah, over there. So, yeah, um, I think we can test it. And this one even has one of those, um, oh look at this, there's a dent in the socket, but it's one of those sockets that attaches itself without a screw, so um, this is important because most of the parallel ports have um, hex sockets over here, so it would collide if there are hex sockets, which was the case for, 
for the uh, simple LPT, so I had to unscrew the whole metal shield here to actually attach it, which isn't a big problem. And you probably want to stick it in a 3D printed case anyway. But that's something to keep in mind. I hope I can fix this, but probably I just need some, some pliers to correct that. I probably got dented in shipping, or I don't know. I don't think I caused this, but I'll just use a bit of force to attach it. So let's also try this out and see if it gives any signs of life. This is what the device looks like when plugged into the printer port. You should probably print a 3D case for that, but it works just fine as is. And it definitely needs the micro USB port for power. Other than that, let's first try the Tandy LPT test program that comes with a card basically. There's a download link in the description. And yeah, it basically plays uh, VGM music. And there's one test song here. An LPT port was detected and we can start the music. To actually be able to play some Tandy music in the games, you need to install a driver, which is called TND LPT. However, I quickly found out that this driver needs a first a 386 or higher, and second of all, a special version of EMM386 or QEMM. Both are memory managers, and EMM is shipped with DOS 6.2, and QEMM is something commercial that was shipped back in the day. So I installed QEMM, which also gives me a nice um, side effect of offering me much more conventional memory. And more than that, it can redirect the port accesses to the Tandy card from the ISA ports 0C0, which is the default for Tandy, to the LPT port actually. Um, otherwise you would have to patch all the games that you want to use. And if you don't or can't do that, then you have to load this sound driver as I'm doing here. And once it's installed, it will redirect all the access to the card to the printer port. And first game that we try with this method is Manic Mansion. And as you can hear, it already produces some clicks on the sound card. So let's start it. So Maniac Mansion works fine. All the early LucasArts games actually support Tandy Sound. You sometimes need to download a special patch so that it skips the detection of the Tandy or PC Junior machines. Um, this is the case for example for Maniac Mansion and also for Zack McCracken which we will have a look at right away. And other games that support the Tandy Sound card are for example almost all of the Sierra games up to maybe 1991 or 1992, around that era, and we'll have some of those later as well. And there is also a plethora of other games from Echolade and many other vendors that actually supported this, because in the US the Tandy standard was actually pretty widespread. I think in Europe or in Germany especially we didn't have much of the Tandy cards. But now let's hear a bit of Monkey Island, which also supports the Tandy sound. And as mentioned before, many of the Sierra games, especially of the late 80s, early 90s, support the Tandy sound. And one of my all-time favorites, of course, is Space Quest 3, and it can never not be in a sound card comparison or test on my channel. So let's have a listen to that as well for a couple of seconds.
And of course, the most popular homebrew game of the DOS scene in the last two years is probably Planet X3. And it has also quite an immense support of graphics modes and sound cards. So the Tandy sound card is also supported and of course it doesn't have any problems with the Tandy LPT after the driver is loaded naturally. So you can listen to this as well and you will notice that the sound quality is just fine. In the late 80s, Sierra actually ported a couple of Japanese arcade games and role-playing games to the PC. One of them is Azeliard and the other is, for example, Silphid, but there were a couple of more. And they also support the Tandy sound system very well. So we will first have a look here at Zilliard, which is also one of the first games to utilize the MCGA 256 color mode, although it only uses 64 colors. And last but not least, you can also play VGM files, which are video game music grips. And there were a couple of game consoles, such as the Sega Master System and the Game Gear and a lot of other, actually, which used the very same chip as the Tandy. So you can just use the TLPD test tool to also play different video game music, like the Sonic theme here. So let's have a listen to that and then we can also go over to the evaluation of all these cards. Okay, so you have seen what the two little LPT sound cards can do. The generic DAC by Matze and Serako's uh, TND LPT. And why do you want this at all? Or how good is it compared to, for example, a standalone Tandy card? Well, there are many reasons to choose this over this or the other way around. For example, you might have a 386 or 486 laptop that doesn't have any ISA slots, then of course you can't install any of these things. But most of the laptops, if not all, do have a parallel printer port. So you can uh, take any of these devices also, for example the OLP2 LPT, and plug them in and use them for Adlib or Tandy Sound or a Kovacs compatible output. So this is definitely one of the reasons you might want to choose that. The sound quality of the Tandy LPT is great, um, the audio quality itself, of course the synthesizer is limited, but um, why would you buy this instead of, for example, the OLP, OPL2 LPT? And the reason is simple, a lot of the very old games don't support the AdLib at all, but they will have PC speaker support or PC Junior or maybe Tandy support, and those games can be either patched or will run as is with this card and the driver. So if you don't want the PC speaker sound, you can get one of these and improve your retro gaming experience basically. Same goes with the Kovacs sound card, or the, well, sound card is a bit <laughs> too much with the Kovacs stack. You can add synthesized speech or music to a lot of very old games, 
um, on devices that either don't support a sound blaster or where the games don't support anything else. So both are definitely good alternatives to increase your gaming experience on a retro PC. If you have ISA slots, of course, you can just simply use one of the many uh, Tandy sound cards. Matze did a couple, and I think they are stuffed by uh, low tech, which are also Tandy compatible. So there's a bunch of things and options that you can choose. But I think this about wraps the video up. I thank you for staying this long, and I hope you subscribe to my channel already. If not, please consider doing that. Leave a like or a dislike if you enjoyed or didn't enjoy the video. Leave a comment and please um, consider coming back to this channel. So I thank you and wish you a very nice evening or day or whatever it is in your time zone.